Welcome back to UFOPM. I'm your host, John Kelly. On this edition of UFOPM, our special guest, Costa McCreese from ETLetstalk.org, shares a lot of exciting information about ET contact, consciousness, and its potential for political, social, and economic change on our planet today. So stick around for our exciting interview with Costa McCreese from ETLetstalk.org here on UFOPM. Costa, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us from the show. Glad to be here. Thank you. You've had a long-standing interest in the space program, even since you were a very young person. Can you tell us a little bit about that background? Oh, absolutely. Like um, many people of my generation in the 60s, I was fascinated by what NASA was doing, the, the, the moonshots, uh, and uh, was glued to the TV. And again, like many kids, just couldn't get enough uh, of the space program and learning about space and and dreaming about uh, where uh, humanity could go to the stars and it was a really exciting time to to be alive and there in my um, Indiana backyard I also had a telescope and many nights even on cold winter nights I was um, out in the backyard looking at the stars at the planets and just familiarizing myself with the heavens and just being in awe um, of, of the whole spectacle in front of me. Uh, that happened at a very early age and, and had a profound effect on my childhood. So you, you got to know the names of the constellations, the other heavenly bodies? That's right, I did. I've forgotten a lot of that, but, uh, but I was on it and I made scrapbooks and showed them to my friends and, and to my teachers. It was a wonderful time, like I said, to be alive when, when so many things were opening up for, for space, for, for, for this country, for planet Earth, and there was a lot of optimism about what we could do. And, and, and space and, and the public involvement with space exploration and space science. Absolutely. Uh, through the miracle of television, then, uh, so many people around the world were able to, to, you know, to take part in, in the, uh, the Mercury, the Gemini, and the, the Apollo space missions back then. Hmm. So when the moon landing happened in, in 69, it really was a worldwide event that, that just lifted everybody and, and, uh, and was a, a, a remarkable event where people would remember where they were at the time that that, that happened. Uh, it's hard to imagine now when we're so used to space shuttle missions and the like uh, to to realize what it was like back then. But it was really a, a, a big show happening all over the planet and it united people in a way that, that um, I had never seen before. I, I, it's a, that brings back memories for me. It was my birthday on, on that uh, day of that event and I was on my grandfather's uh, front deck looking through the telescope uh, that he enjoyed using. So. Uh, very memorable times, as you say, and a great, a great wave of optimism, public optimism, and a connection with the space program. But beyond, you know, conventional space sciences and our understanding, you also get, gather an interest in, in issues related to UFOs and ETs. And how did that begin for you? Well, it began with a paperback book I found in my local drugstore on, on the uh, revolving stand there. Uh, there weren't that many types of books like that back then, but I was opening up to so many things. And I saw my first UFO book. Uh, don't remember the title of it, but it had a lot of pictures, compelling stories, eyewitness accounts. And so I was hooked from that point. I just could not read enough. So I sought out more books. I sought out magazines, information, wherever I could get it to just dive into the subject. Uh, it fascinated me to think about the, the life that might be out there among the stars. And uh, would, was that life visiting us? And to me, the, the evidence was compelling. Sure, there, were, there was probably a lot of uh, fakery and mistaken um, identification of, of UFOs, but there was always that small percentage that uh, even in the public was alluded to that was always unexplainable. And at times when you found eyewitnesses that, uh, that you felt that you could believe and pictures that they had taken that you uh, believed uh, had not been faked in any way, then that's all it took. I was I was just uh, just amazed by it all and wanted to tell my friends and and do science projects uh, at school on on UFOs and on the topic of, of life visiting Earth. Yeah. So it began back then. You you were able to d discern the signal even through the noise, the din, and the hubbub, uh, the controversy. Yeah. Uh, it, you you were you latched onto something real and you knew it, uh, and uh, that that's carried you forward to today. That's that's true. Uh, I. Uh, I uh, sort of gave up the interest in that, like so many interests uh, of my childhood, you know, among them baseball and, and, and other things. 
because I went uh, to college, got a, uh, a professional degree in computer science, mathematics, and did very many conventional things like get a, a job out of college and pursue a, a career, get married, um, have children, get divorced, and get remarried. So my interest was always there below the surface, but on a conscious basis, I was uh, doing a fairly normal life for the United States in those days of just making my mark in the world, making a living and, and establishing myself uh, and always wanting to get back to some of the topics of my childhood, but never seeming to find the time because life just was getting too busy with with uh, uh, work a day kind of things along so the way. So you're a practical man, you're involved in computer sciences, you're involved in family life, but you have esoteric interests and you want to fulfill some of your ambitions in these areas as well. That's right. I neglected to mention that when my interest as a child in, in UFOs happened, I also opened up to metaphysics. Uh, I couldn't uh, get enough of learning about uh, meditation, ESP, astrology, um, other cultures with their other differing beliefs, spirituality in the widest, most inclusive sense of that, uh, subjects like Atlantis. All of this fascinated me, and so I did a lot of reading and just gave me uh, a vast perspective on really what it meant to be human uh, over the long course of planetary history. There were just so many mysteries out there that we never knew everything about, and that, that fascinated me and, and made me want to learn more. So that kind of interest also was bubbling beneath the surface um, all the years that um, I was doing all the practical things. So as you say, you're someone who, has a, who feels a connection with issues related to mysticism, personal spirituality, the mysteries of the universe, and it's within that context that uh, UFO and ET contact are, are, are happening. In other words, uh, you're, already, you're already somebody who's open and broad-minded enough mm -hmm. to appreciate there's many different and interesting and, and, and emerging areas of knowledge. This just happens to be the special area of interest, the UFO ET topic. It just happens to be one of many. Uh, that's true, but uh, I find now that since 2006 when I was reintroduced to uh, the UFO topic, and I can tell you more about that in detail, uh, but I found that since then the uh, creation of this website, etletstalk.org, is a culmination, it's, it's a mission that brings together all these different threads in my life, uh, the threads of of meditation, of visualization, spirituality, uh, humanitarianism, uh, looking at uh, the earth uh, with its place in the cosmos and what that might mean, uh, looking at ecology and what we're doing to the planet, looking at the, the social situation on this planet as we're, we're fighting wars and, uh, and staying on fossil fuels and things like that. There's so many topics that are interwoven uh, between my interest and what's going on in the world that I find that the mission I'm doing now with ETLetstalk.org is something that's allowing me to, to make a contribution to creating a better world so that we can solve some of those problems that I mentioned and others, and in the process re-enter into a, a galactic dialogue with the, the benevolent star civilizations that, that are visiting right now. All right, so, so this is a very broad and... Uh, um, uh well, it's a very broad agenda, a very ambitious agenda, uh, but you're, you feel that you, through, through this work, through ET Let's Talk, the community that you're building there, and these studies and research that you're helping to support, uh, your, your, your life is touching in all these important areas that, that are ch challenging people all around the world. That's true, and um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have found uh, good teammates, Laurie and Jonathan, who, who share the passion I have at etletstalk.org. They have helped uh, me together. We've built the, the community there. We're almost up. I, th I think actually we're probably over 3,000 members now who come visit there and, and get to know each other and, and talk about the contact. So it's a real focal point. Uh, yes, the larger picture of human beings connecting with uh, star visitors and all the different civilizations does touch upon all these other subjects uh, that, of, of things that are going on Earth. But I have to say that I think as far as human history, the most incredible story out there is that we are being visited and that we, are, we have the ability, and this is what we're teaching people on etletstalk.org, we have the ability to engage these civilizations in, in, a, in a, 
a spiritual and an intellectual and a peaceful way to find how they can help us because they are willing to do that how they can help us to get through this time of transition in which we find ourselves uh, and help us not to you know destroy ourselves or the the ecosystem in the process so you know we have that choice as humanity whether we're going to go uh, the way of the dinosaurs extinction or whether we're going to take the next leap forward and literally reach the stars and we have the the, the type of help that we need from um, our space visitors to do that if we interact and ask for it well anyone who's involved or who's looked at this topic ufos et's disclosure you know the pervasive influence of dr stephen greer is inescapable and uh, you had contact with his work at one point in this process of discovery. Can you tell us how you found out about Dr. Stephen Greer's and, and what he was doing? Yes, it was in 2006 when um, I was surfing on the net uh, looking for the topic of UFOs. I had just sat down and wondered, you know, hey, I wonder what's been going on in the field. I've kind of had my uh, head buried in, in uh, the sand of, of, well, actually not the sand, but it was open making a living and living an ordinary kind of life and there was dr greer's disclosure project and i was amazed i was blown away because what made that project and his work different from the other ufo researchers that that i very minimally had encountered as i began my re-exploration was the fact that he had all these witnesses uh, military people ex-faa people uh, uh others in the, the corporate world who had come forth in the, the hundreds by that point to give their testimony about the projects they had worked in which had contacted these civilizations and in some cases maybe not treated them so well but these these were all whistleblowers who had courageously come on video uh, at the time and spoken their truths and what they had worked on to Dr. Greer so with all that evidence that he was offering uh, of these um, highly profiled and credible kind of witnesses um, I was convinced. I said, you know, if, if these people are able to talk about it and, and tell us what they've seen and give us real evidence, hard evidence, then this is good enough for me and I wanted to learn more. That was my introduction to the Disclosure Project. Hmm. Well, another another important contribution that Dr. Greer and the CSETI group have, have uh, added to the, this, the discourse on UFO, the UFO and ET contact issue is the definition of the close encounter as a close encounter of, of the fifth kind and uh, it implies things like bi-directional communications can you tell us more about what is what a ce5 entails yeah you're right it's a close it's a close encounter of the fifth kind and i'll back up just a little bit and say that close encounters uh, of the first through the fourth kind each have their own definition but they're all uh they have one thing in common which is they're all passive uh, those de those encounters happen to a human being. They they happen to see a UFO and then they describe a certain kind of interac interaction. And then based on the parameters of that interaction, then you can classify the experience they've just had as a, a CE1, a 2, a 3, or a 4. That's all fine and well, and that's well defined. But a CE5 is different. Uh, Dr. Greer was teaching people to use consciousness-based communication. It was human initiated and it was bilateral in that once the connection was made to ETI or ET intelligence, then the human and the ETs could find a way back and forth uh, to communicate and to learn with each other. And that totally uh, gave us a, a whole new ball game as far as I'm concerned, because it put the power back to those of us who might have been feeling powerless. It gave us the ability to, to use the protocols, to use consciousness, and to make this contact on our own. So once having made contact, as I've been finding out from the community of people at etletstalk.org, once you've made that contact in, in various different ways, and you've satisfied yourself that, that it is genuine, then nobody can take that away from you. And, and that's the power of the community right now, is that people have taken their power back they don't need an expert to tell them what they saw or or that they didn't see it or that they should sign an NDA and never discuss it, move right along here, nothing to see, all that kind of thing. Um, it's very empowering to people and we've discovered with our hundreds of teams and thousands of experiences that people love that and then they love to share the stories in the community forum with other people that 
people that they may never meet, but who are part of the, the, community, the community on etletstalk.org and who want to hear of the different kinds of experiences that others are having. And believe me, it's all over the map. It's fascinating. Well, tell me, some, what are some of the ways in which these close encounters of the fifth kind manifest in, in, in personal experience? Well, there's, uh, of course, the obvious way, and, and you learn how to discern when you're looking in the sky what is uh, man-made and what is explainable eventually with uh, versus what is not explainable, and then you pay attention to that. So with some experience, you get better at, um, at uh, eliminating satellites, planets, aircraft, uh, stars, and other natural types of phenomenon, and then realizing that you're seeing something that really is otherworldly. So there's the, the visual part right there. There's, there's the sighting. And many of us, of course, are thrilled by that. And our reports are, are full of experiences from people who have had sightings of uh, whether sometimes up close, sometimes far away, all different kinds of movement, all kinds of flashing on and off uh, to the, the uh, ground-based observers that goes on. But that's only one, one of the ways. Another way is through telepathy. Many members tell us that they, uh, they can get messages and they can speak in sentences when they're in, in the right kind of state, uh, which is usually a meditative, calm, deep type of state. Or they can get it in, uh, in lucid dreams. We have uh, experiencers that, that report that as well, where ETI, extraterrestrial intelligence, will contact them that way. And uh, it will be a very vivid dream. Um, and that gets reported too. Other ways are through uh, even even a physical touch. Uh, it might be a, a firm touch on the shoulder or on the knee, uh, or we even had one member who had had her nose pinched a little bit like this, and it kind of been fun when there was nobody there. Um, and, and that just goes on. Uh, other people have reported feeling waves of love uh, just coming through them and and just lifting them and inspiring them. People have. Uh, reported uh, the temperature changing around them. They reported what we are calling orbs suddenly appearing in the room and moving about. Uh, as well, um, electrical phenomenon does go on. Uh, people whose um, iPhones may have been turned off will suddenly turn on, for example, and start playing a song that um, that is not even present on the iPhone. And uh, also radar detectors have gone off and produced anomalous results in the middle of a forest where th there is no other signal going on. It, it just goes on and on. The important thing is that um, extraterrestrial intelligence will find a safe way to, to manifest, to communicate, because there is a control group that has been suppressing the evidence of, of these visitations on Earth for at least a hundred years that we know of, then the visitors, the star visitors have to be careful because there are space-based weapons arrayed against them and they do get shot at and every now and then they do get hit. So they will not endanger human beings um, out of love and respect for us, but they will find a safe time and place to communicate. And some of the methods that I was just talking about uh, are the different ways that the communication can happen. Mm -hmm. So this is moving away from um, orientations towards uh, you know cold, cold case investigations where where you, UFO studies means we need to uh, find out what happened in 1980 or 1960 or 1940 we're talking about direct experiential learning experiences that are happening today and that seemingly are accessible to the average person with a little bit of you know a little bit of uh, support a little bit of uh, learning it, it seems almost anybody could participate is that right that's right, and we have instructions on our website on etletstalk.org uh, about how to, to do the protocols and make contact, suggestions and instructions. We also have the rest of the community that um, a new person can come on board and, and talk with about their experiences, about uh, ways that they've modified their approach, and, and so it's a learning place. Um, it's also a safe place, I have to say, for people who want to talk about this topic, and it's a secure place unlike many of the, the, the social websites that are out there right now, uh, because people can be themselves, talk about their experiences, and they won't be monitored by any software or commercialized. Uh, instead, they're, they're going to find friends there who want to teach them and, and, and learn from them as well. 
And that was the whole idea is to create this community and to have our own experiences. Since um, October 2010, when I founded the Global CE5 ET Contact Initiative, we've been sending our teams out at least once a month, usually on a Saturday uh, near the full, the, the rather the new moon, when it's um, uh, when when there's a darker sky. Hmm. And we've sent our teams out over a 24-hour period because we're spread out all over the planet, and the 24 hours gives us enough time, no matter what time zone that we're in, to 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 join up with a larger group. And we started out with 40-ish some groups in October of 2010, doing this once a month, and then reporting back what we found. As of last month, we had a record-breaking month where we fielded 600 teams in more than 34 countries on May 11th doing the CT contact. The reports from that are just now beginning to come in as people place those reports, write about their experiences um, on our forums on etletstalk.org. So this is a vital, growing, experiential community that's really on the vanguard, on the forefront of, of this type of effort that we don't believe this has ever been tried before on an ongoing basis where human beings now have the means to engage extraterrestrial intelligence because governments haven't done the job of telling us the truth about the presence and the full truth then we the people now are taking the power back and empowering each other and joining up with each other in community to do that job ourselves and we're just waiting to see where that's going to take us. I think it's incredibly exciting. Well, there are all these cultural and social and political implications, but I think, you know, to, to highlight, um, I think it's very significant that these, this type of study is um, helping us to develop an understanding of the role of human consciousness and perception and, uh, and other, other types of influences, you know, cosmic influences on, on, on consciousness, cognition, and behavior. Uh, that th this is fertile ground to explore that because there there is the ET element, the ETI, as a as a I I interacting or intervening even in in you know in our experience. I I've heard some of the stories of the contactees who participated in in CSETI trainings and workshops, and uh, their comments are profound uh, as to the uh, in intensity of the perceptions. And the, and the knowingness that comes with uh, uh, the interactions that says to them, you know, this is not like other experiences that I've had. This is very different. Uh, the voice that I hear or the light that I see is discreet and it's in its own way is unique. And I can't I can't but help begin to feel that I'm participating in the in communication with another intelligence that's related to uh, extraterrestrial spacecraft. So. Yeah. I, I, yeah, this this whole direction of leading us into consciousness studies as a consequence of what typical ufology will want to look at nuts and bolts and ask questions mm -hmm. about where is the crash spacecraft and you know and so on and so on. This this is flipping the coin and, and say, we're looking back within ourselves and we're being asked to summon resources, you know, d develop our minds in such ways that we can gain parallelism with what you know high, higher developed civilizations and their and their representatives. Uh, I agree with everything you say, and let me give you an example of, of a contact that, that I think highlights the, the beautiful experience of, of just that, of making that connection with the higher intelligence. Uh, during one of the, uh, the, the week-long trainings at Mount Shasta that uh, myself and my wife uh, attended, one night, um, about 7,000 feet up the side of the mountain, we were outside doing contact with Dr. Greer. And there were about 40 or 50 people. When the meditation that we were doing out there was finished, uh, let me back up a little bit and say that uh, while we were meditating, the sky was, was clouded over. Uh, we uh, had no wind. But when we finished the meditation, um, my wife nudged me and said, look up. And right above the, the circle of, of those of us gathered out there, looking straight up at the zenith of the sky, a black circle of space had opened up, almost like we had uh, burned the clouds away. The clouds were still there in the rest of the sky, you understand, and there was no wind. But as you look straight up, then you could see a sizable black hole and the stars shining through. From the middle of that hole, uh, for the next minute or two, you could see white, wispy uh, cloud start appearing and then appearing more and more, gaining more volume, getting thicker. Uh, this was amazing. We, we didn't know what was going on, but we watched it just 
just developing there, becoming thicker, larger. Finally, someone pointed up, my wife also did it, and, and yelled out, oh my God, look at the shape. It's a heart. It's a giant heart-shaped cloud sitting in the middle of that blackness. At that same moment, someone from across the circle announced to the whole group, I just received a strong telepathic message from the ETs that are up there. They're saying to all of us, we love you. And that's how they showed it. That kind of experience is something I can never forget. Uh, I can't explain it away as anything else. As anything else. I was with many other people, and I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> right. Well, the, the world, so it seems, is a very special place after all, and it's within our means to, to experience it this way. If, you know, if we bring ourselves forward, as you said, with intent, you know, positive, loving intent, uh, the universe is responding, and it's within our grasp. You know, we're not necessarily needing so many middlemen to intervene on our part. Uh, if, we take, if we take some initiative and share and, you know, mm -hmm. participate w with community, the, the world is, is waiting for us, so, so to speak, to, to step up to the plate and, and take, take part in, in these profound events. And not only the world is waiting, but the ETs are waiting through messages that we have received. They asked us to put as many teams in the field as possible, uh, teams of humans, to communicate with them, to try these protocols. They asked us to do that in as many places as possible, as many countries, uh, to do it uh, as quickly as possible, and as many teams. So we're up to 600 now, and we're going to keep working at that. Hmm. And the reason they want so many is that because as more human beings may attempt to make this contact, the more the permission will be given by us for ETI to reveal themselves in the skies. And this becomes a virtuous circle, you understand, as they reveal more of themselves in the skies or through other means that they do communicate that I mentioned before, then more human beings will want to make this peaceful contact and therefore more ETIs will respond. That's a virtuous circle. At some point, there will be a tipping point where so many thousands of teams are doing this concurrently that the ability to suppress all of these contacts just simply won't be there on the part of the control group. And that will lead to a new era. Uh, the movie Sirius asks the, the, that uh, Dr. Greer and Arm Kalika and J.D. Seraphine put together talks about many of the topics that we mentioned here, including the CE5 and, and the contact. One question, though, that, that's overriding is, okay, how are they getting here? They're using some kind of energy. The implications that you're talking about, John, for the world are that if the ETs are allowed to fully interact with us in full open contact, Imagine the technologies, the free energy that they're using for propulsion and for the other things they do that can be used here on Earth, that has been actually suppressed here on Earth by Earth-based inventors, but it's what the cosmics, the galactics are also using. That free energy would remake the world. Uh, people ask the question, well, I know they're out there and I kind of believe that life exists, but what's that got to do with me, with my life? I gotta you know, go to school, I gotta go to my job, gotta pay my bills, what's that got to do with me? My answer is it's got everything to do with you because the free energy technologies, once implemented on Earth, would mean an end to us having to pay money for the meter. And, you know, imagine your house being powered, your car, your school, your, uh, your factory, your city, your country by energy that's limitless, free and clean forever. And those are, that's just one example of the technologies that the ETs can bring. That has everything to do with our lives. We won't have to, to work so hard. It, uh, it will restructure our societies in different ways. Will we need wars over fossil fuels and resources? No. Will we need uh, to defile or befoul our, our environment, destroy it with fossil fuels? No, we won't. Will we need to, uh, to fight over other resources? Will we need to have poverty and hunger? Not if we have this free energy. And I'm not saying this would happen overnight in an idealistic kind of way, but Let's give that a try once those free energies are available to us, once we can get the ETs to walk openly and work openly with us. That's what we're working for. That's a, a world that really will be revolutionized and it's something worthy of people's pursuit. At etletstalk.org, we're offering people one person at a time to join this effort, make their own contact, be thrilled by it, 
but add their energy to the energy of the community, which is on the vanguard of bringing this new world uh, forward for all of us. And it will be in cooperation and in partnership with the ETIs who do love us. So, so really, uh, these, this, this form of research, this type of study, isn't just about satisfying our intellectual curiosity, you know, is there life on other planets? This is, at, at the ground level, this is really a, a form of social and political activism, and it's about the creation of a new economy based on these uh, suppressed technologies, uh, moving us away from the war-based economy, moving us into uh, a new era of peace and, and, and civilization for everybody. Absolutely, and if that isn't worth uh, someone taking you know a, a day out of their month to try to give energy to I don't know what is because this has ramifications for our children our children's 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 children you know all the way down the line we're on that vanguard right now we're in that time of transition where we have the help of these visitors and we have the tipping point that's very near we just have to make that decision as individuals to, to join with others in the community, to make our mark, to add our energy, and it will make a difference. It's already making a difference. Things um, are happening. You are, you are on the vanguard. You know, you, you were in Washington, D.C. recently at the Citizens yeah. Hearing. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience there and how it plays into what's happening at ETLetstalk.org? Yeah, uh, I was there for only the first day Monday, but during that first day, many of the leading researchers uh, were on the panel there facing the six politicians who were performing this mock um, congressional hearing. It was very professionally done, very in a very sober type of manner, uh, and it was captured on camera of, of across the world and on, on YouTube, so people can just look for citizen hearing uh, in Washington, D.C. on April 22nd. Now, during the day that I was there, um, one, th one thing that really struck me was from the morning till sometime in the middle of the afternoon, the, the panel of, of politicians who was quizzing all the um, UFO ET experts People like you know, Doctor uh, like Stephen Bassett, Doctor Greer, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, Daniel Sheehan, uh, Grant Cameron, and others. Uh, they were asking them questions just to gather facts, the way that a that a committee, a real congressional committee, would do. And they were they were getting responses and getting follow up questions answered as well. So this was proceeding very well and in a in a serious professional manner. What I noticed was by the by the um, afternoon, I think after the break. They had, the uh, politicians had heard uh, so much compelling, riveting evidence from the panelists just thus far, just not even the first day was finished, that I think they were in awe and their jaws were dropping. Now, if that's not the case, at least that's my perception, because their questions then changed from, you know, give us the facts, A, B, C, D, to, oh my God, what can we do? What can we do? Tell us. One of them, I don't remember which, it might have been the former Senator Mike Gravel, um, or not, I don't remember, but one of them actually said, would all of you produce a summary for us by Friday when these proceedings end and give us a list of uh, points of, of what we can do, what action we can take as we move away from here, as this thing ends? What's, what are some next steps where we, we can do some good moving forward? And that's how things had just changed in one day. Now, the rest of the week, you can see a lot of YouTube videos with the testimony of others, um, also compelling. But I saw that shift happen in, in, in one day, and that to me was impressive. Because if their minds can be changed, if their uh, skepticism can be convinced by this kind of testimony and by the facts uh, from the leading researchers, then then the sky's the limit. Uh, we don't know where where the action's going to go, but I, I did hear that there is a move to get the United Nations, uh, to get a country in the United Nations to sponsor a resolution that would create an agency in the UN that would uh, further study this topic and open it up that way. Um, so a lot of good came out of that. As you say, this is something that has the power to soften and move the hearts of the politicians. So uh, certainly this isn't something that should be kept in the bottle. This is something that needs to be, uh, in, our culture needs to be infused with more of this type of positive energy and these positive initiatives. That's true. Uh, do we wish that the mainstream media would have given more uh, sober, realistic coverage of this? Of course. Um, at best, they treated it with neutrality. I saw some great reports, uh, one from a Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas TV station. 
But most of the reports, you know, had a little bit of snide remarks, and they didn't go to the level of little green men like they used to. So they raised the level of their snideness, I guess, or smirkiness to something else. Uh, but still, even treating it that way, the, the, the word does get out, and thank goodness we have the Internet now so that the, the, the testimony of all these witnesses is available. You don't even really need the mainstream media. You can put on the videos, look for yourself, make up your own mind. And there's the power. We, we want a lot of these videos to go, to, to go viral and let people make up their own minds by seeing the, the evidence from the researchers. Uh, and that's in addition to the people coming to etletstalk.org, for example, and having their own experiences. There's nothing like, like having your own. Absolutely. We're, we're just about ready to wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to add to the many important things that you shared in the last half hour? I want to invite people who have an open mind about this topic and who can approach it with uh, peace and goodwill intentions in their heart. If, if you're an, a hard-nosed skeptic or a prove it to me, damn it type of person, I don't think this will work for you. But for those who really have the, the attitude of peace and genuine wanting to to cooperate and to make contact, I invite you to come to etletstalk.org uh, to sign up and become part of the community there to uh, to join us. Uh, the paid members on the community are, have access to a community map there that spans the whole world so that you can zoom in as you would on a Google map and find people in your neighborhood, in your neighboring city or in your state or your country who are also doing this kind of contact and get their email address and, and, and hook up with them. And that's how we build community. So uh, we think it's a fun place to, to come, and and it's a great place to start changing the future right now, one person at a time, one contact experience at a time. And then you can send your experience and your report and put it on the forum up there and have other people uh, learn from you and be inspired by you and educated by what you've done. Well, it's a very positive initiative, and I wish you all the success in the world. I hope that we'll be able to bring you back again to talk more about some of these topics. Uh, you have so much to say, and I think the audience uh, can, can learn a lot from your experiences as well. Thank you very much, Costa. Uh, excellent speaking with you on the show. Thank you for the opportunity, John.